Good afternoon, everyone. Is this working? Good. Great. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to a very special occasion today uh, and a very special visit uh, this week by Dr. Uh, Arturo Valenzuela. This is our, uh, Arturo is our class of 1950 speaker. And I wanted just to read something to you about the class of 1950 fellow. Uh, and I don't know if any of, there are any members of that class in the audience today. If, if someone is, please raise your hand. Is anyone here from the class of 1950? Well, I just want to express my great appreciation to that class. Uh, it's their generous contribution that has you know, allowed this program you know, to go on. And let me just read this to you. The Class of 1950 Fellows Program was inaugurated in the spring term of the year 2001. Members of the class were the first to benefit from four full years of President John Sloan Dickey's enterprise to better prepare future generations of Dartmouth students for global leadership. At their 50th reunion in the spring of the year 2000, the class presented a generous gift to the Dickey Center with the purpose, quote, to bring distinguished foreign leaders, scholars, and specialists to the Dartmouth campus for short periods to interface with the students on the important issues of the day as class of 1950 Senior Foreign Affairs Fellows. And I must say that, you know, during the program uh, for Professor Valenzuela this week, he'll be giving this lecture, but he'll also be visiting a number of classes. Uh, he'll be holding, you know, uh, meetings with individual students. He'll be holding lunches and dinners with a variety of groups. And, and we're absolutely delighted, uh, you know, to have him here with us today. When we were deciding on the, on the speaker uh, and also our choice for the class of 1950 fellow, uh, we spent a lot of time at the Dickey Center, you know, deliberating, you know, who exactly, you know, we should invite and what subject uh, we should cover. And we decided after, you know, a long period of discussion that, that the region and the area that we really wanted to cover uh, was Latin America. Uh, this is an area uh, which is obviously critical uh, to U.S. interest, to U.S. foreign policy, and to U.S. security. Uh, but I think it really gets short shrift, and I think a lot of people uh, believe that, that it's an area whose importance, uh, you know, is simply not reflected in the attention it gets. And when we decided to, to look for, you know, a specialist in that area, uh, we, we consulted our faculty here, and the unanimous choice uh, was Professor Arturo Valenzuela, and we're absolutely delighted, you know, to have him here today. And let me just tell you a little bit about uh, Professor Valenzuela. Um, he is currently the pre a Professor of Government and Director of the Center for Latin American Studies in the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University in Washington. And prior to joining, joining the Georgetown faculty, uh, he was professor of political science and director of the Council of Latin American Studies at Duke University uh, for several years. He's also been a visiting scholar at Oxford University, the University of Sussex, the University of Florence, the University of Chile, and the Catholic University of Chile and also a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, he is a BA uh, summa cum laude from Drew University and his MA and PhD degrees in political science uh, are from Columbia University. And what particularly endears me to uh, uh, Professor Valenzuela is he's been both a scholar and a practitioner, a model that I love very, very much. Uh, during President uh, Clinton's second term in office, uh, Dr. Valenzuela served at the White House as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Inter-American Affairs at the National Security Council. And during the Clinton first term, uh, he served in the State Department as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Inter-American uh, inter Affairs. Um, 
He is a specialist uh, on the origins and consolidation of democracy, Latin American politics, electoral systems, civil military relations, political parties, regime transitions, and U.S. Latin American relations. Uh, he is an expert on the politics of the Southern Cone and Mexican politics, and he is the author or co-author of nine books, uh, including Political Brokers in Chile and the Breakdown of Democratic Regimes, Chile. I would also say that uh, he serves on many, many boards of trustees. Uh, he is an advisor to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, amongst other, other important places, a consultant. He's been on numerous uh, important uh, TV programs, all the major cable and, and interview shows, Jim Lehrer, et cetera. And his subject today, uh, is exactly the one that we had hoped that that we would you know that we would focus on during uh, this week, and it's entitled "The Challenge of Democratic Consolidation in Latin America and Implications for U.S. Interests." Please join me in welcoming Professor Arturo Valenzuela. Thanks very much. Uh, it's a uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to be the uh, Class of 1950 Senior Foreign Affairs Fellow. Uh, and uh, Ambassador uh, Yalowitz was very kind in his uh, introductions. And I'm, as I say, it's, it's great to be here. I've had the privilege of speaking on the Dartmouth campus a couple times before. Um, and uh, the last time, I think, was in a class that uh, Jorge Castañeda, who later became foreign minister of, of Mexico, uh, taught here uh, at Dartmouth. But I don't remember when it was. It was some time ago. Uh, it's, it's a real uh, privilege to, to address this topic. Uh, it's something that I've been concerned about for a long time, both as an academic as well as a, a policymaker. Uh, I became intrigued as an academic early on when I was doing my graduate work on why it was that some countries in Latin America had more successful trajectories of democratic politics than others. Uh, and of course, in the government, I was privileged to serve at the time that the, after the Cold War had ended when the United States began to focus uh, on uh, issues of democratic uh, development and consolidation throughout the world. Uh, and of course, as we all know today, that's, this is a very important topic because uh, it's become, again, the cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy uh, uh, it, in, a, in a sort of ironic twist, I guess, because you have a president that began as an isolationist and then skipped being a realist and went immediately to being an idealist uh, uh, and more Wilsonian probably than, than any other uh, president that we've had in memory. <clears throat> much to the chagrin, I think, of the realists in the, Demo in the Republican Party. But at any rate, uh, uh, it, this is a, a significant and an important uh, topic. Uh, as Ambassador Yalowitz said, I, I, I do a lot of media. This past week I've been doing a lot of media because there was a little bit of wind of attention on Latin America with the election of the Secretary General of the Organization of American States, so I've been handling press inquiries all week. And people call and say, this is a terrible time, isn't it, for Latin America? This is really a bad moment. Things are really going I I south, uh, literally. Uh, and uh, what, what, uh, what disturbs uh, uh, us is, uh, uh, they say, it, it appears that, that, that not only is democracy failing the coup in Ecuador, or that democracy is being abused, Venezuela, uh, but that a lot of places uh, like Nicaragua and others are just simply not getting off the ground. And, and I think that, the, you know, there is a valid concern. But let me try to frame the, the issue, the discussion, in, 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 a, in, in the way it needs to be framed, and that is in a, in a kind of a broader uh, uh, context, a broader, broader probably historical context, uh, and then make some remarks about the state of democracy in Latin America, and then come around to a discussion of, of U.S. interests. Um, the truth of the matter is that this is still a very, very good moment for democracy in Latin America. Uh, it's easy for us to forget that it wasn't that long ago that we had civil wars in Central America. Uh, 
estimates are that 200,000 people died in Guatemala during the period of, from about 1953-54 uh, uh, up until, until fairly recently, until the end of the 80s. Uh, also, remember that most of Latin America had authoritarian regimes during the period of the 60s, 70s, ending in the early 80s. In fact, only three countries, Colombia, Venezuela, ironically, and Costa Rica, avoid the authoritarian regimes of that period. So most of the countries in, in Latin America suffered under authoritarianism, and many countries had significant civil conflicts. And if you add to that significant intrastate conflicts, the Argentines and the Chileans almost went to war in 1977. Uh, and and there, were, there have been conflicts, significant conflicts, in, in other places as well. Given that context, things don't look so bad uh, today. In fact, let me remind you, too, that from 1930 till 1980, there were 277 changes of government. 1930, 1980, 277 changes of government. Of those 277 changes of government, 104 were by military coups. That's almost 40% of all changes of government. That was a very difficult situation, I think. And in fact, one of the real problems in Latin America, historically, is whenever democracy had trouble, whenever there, was, there were problems in consolidating democratic institutions, the solution was for the military to come in and take care of the problem. And instead of addressing the problems of democracy within democracy, with all of its difficulties, the solutions were authoritarian outcomes. They were always, they were always made uh, in the name of democracy, in the name of strengthening democracy in the future. And of course, that made it much more difficult to consolidate uh, democratic institutions. Well, this pattern changes in the 1980s rather dramatically. In fact, in the 1980s, 1980s has the lowest number of military coups in any decade since the beginning of the 19th century when Latin American countries become independent nation states. Seven of 37 changes of government are through military coups. And since then, since 1990, until the year 2005, that is 15 years, there's only been one military coup of the classic variety. And that, of course, was the overthrow of Aristide in Haiti in uh, December of 1991. And then there was one uh, interruption of the, of the constitutional order by a sitting president, the president of Peru, when he shut down the Congress in 1992, uh, and he had support from the military to do that. Those are the only really overt constitutional interruptions of the democratic political process in the region, although there have been many, many accidental interruptions, and I'll get to this a little bit later on. But this is, this is in a sense, still the great era of democratic governance in Latin America. The third, what Huntington called the third wave is still very much the case for the region. Uh, and again, let me insist that probably the most important single factoid in this is that the military is not playing the role that it did before. The military has essentially withdrawn from overt involvement in politics and the overt overthrow of regimes, although the military in many countries continues to have significant influence. OK, folks, that's the good news. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is to see how we continue to consolidate democracy, and I'll get to that. The bad news is, of course, that there's a lot of disillusionment. This era of, of uh, democratization begins, as I said, in the 1980s. Uh, it actually be begins probably in Bolivia with the restitution of Hernán Siles Suazo, who's who was overthrown uh, in Bolivia. Uh, was not permitted to, to become president by the military in a period between 1979 and 1981 in Bolivia when you had 11 different changes of government. Uh, and then after that, you know, you, 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 you begin to see a process of democratic consolidation. 
throughout the era. But there's a disillusionment, as I say. Um, surveys in country after country show that people think that democracy has not really been as effective as it should have been. There's a tremendous amount of concern over the quality of democracy. Uh, people are extremely critical of political parties and of their leaders. And there are all kinds of surveys uh, that show this. Uh, there's one very controversial survey that came out not too long ago by the United Nations where people were asked the following question. And this got headlines all over the place. Uh, and the question was, if an authoritarian government resolved all of your problems, would you support an authoritarian government? Would you welcome an authoritarian government? And 54% of the people said, yes. And the headlines were all over the place, Latin Americans reject democracy. <laughs> well, the question was asked in a somewhat loaded fashion. Uh, you know, if somebody's going to resolve all your problems, would you support? What's really amazing about that statistic is that 48% of the people said, if they solve all my problems and it's an authoritarian, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And in fact, the same polls do show that only 20% of the people in the region do support authoritarianism. 80% still are, you know, supportive of democracy, but very disillusioned with democracy. And that's a serious, serious problem. In fact, not only is there, there's a disillusionment with democracy, in many ways, democratic governments have been failing. The recent overthrow of Lucio Gutierrez, uh, overthrow in, 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 in quotation marks, in Ecuador, which happened just a couple of weeks ago, marks now the 15th democratic president that has not been able to end his constitutional term in office and has had to leave office, essentially through resignation. Uh, there have been a couple of presidents that have been impeached in Brazil and Venezuela. Uh, th there was one president who tried to shut down the Congress, and, the con and he was impeached instead. Uh, but most presidents have been failed presidents. Uh, and these 15 failed presidents did not end their terms, uh, leading to significant crises of governance. And uh, this is a serious problem. Now, before we get too uh, concerned about it, let me just let me just make kind of more of a more of a theoretical point. I think that it's a serious mistake to confuse the establishment of democracy with its consolidation. For the first time, many countries in Latin America were, in fact, trying democratic institutions really for the first time, and I think it really is somewhat myopic and ahistorical to sort of assume that somehow in a period of 10, even 20 years, or even more, that somehow you can consolidate democratic institutions. So let's not confuse the establishment of democracy with its consolidation. Uh, in fact, you know, it, it's probably worth reminding us, ourselves, that the consolidation of democratic institutions in, in important countries in Western Europe is a post-World War II phenomenon. Let's remember that. Countries as important as Germany, as important as Italy, as important as Spain. Uh, not, to, not to mention the fact that much of Christian Europe today still hasn't consolidated. A significant portion of Christian Europe still has not consolidated democratic institutions. So this is a complex, long-term process. Let me very briefly outline for you uh, what are some of the challenges of democracy in the region and some of the issues that the countries need to address before I then come back and talk about U.S. policy. In my view, what Latin America faces are four interrelated challenges, or you, you might call them crises. The first is the crisis of governmental capacity. Uh, there's something I haven't really talked about, and it's not central to my discussion today, but <clears throat> I'm sure somebody's going to ask me a question if I don't raise it now, and that is that 
<clears throat> these are democratic governments that face huge challenges in societies with enormous, enormous economic and social problems. Latin America is the region of the world with the highest levels of inequality. And the uh, sort of uh, the, the dilemma that, it, that is posed by these inequalities is something that's very challenging for democratic uh, governments. And many of the institutions of governance in these weak democracies are simply not up to the task. Uh, they don't have the resources. They don't have the structures. They don't have the organization. They don't have the leadership often in order to be able to respond as governments are required to respond. You know, admitting that the private sector and, of course, uh, other sectors of society also are, have to play an important role. But there's a deficit of, 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 of capacity. And I don't want, I don't want to, to dwell on that too much. <laughs> the second deficit is a, is a very serious one, and that's what we might call uh, the challenge of accountability. And this relates to the issue of the rule of law uh, and the question of judicial institutions that don't function properly, uh, democratic institutions that often don't adhere directly to the rule of law, uh, a predominance of private regardedness over public regardedness in some of the calculations that many of the actors make. Uh, and this is a really significant uh, challenge. And without uh, a strengthening of the rule of law, th these countries are going to face significant difficulties. And not only is this a problem for democracy, of course these things are interrelated, but it's also a, pro a problem in efforts to try to get economies uh, you know, on track to, to, to be ef effectively integrated into a globalized economy without the appropriate rules, without what's known today as the second or third generation reforms, it's very difficult for these societies to uh, increase their competitiveness levels in order to be engaged properly in the world economy. <clears throat> the third challenge it fits more along the lines of the kinds of things I do research on, and that's a challenge of representation, the crisis of representation. And this has to do with a complicated mechanism that we all know is, is essential to democracy, and that is how do you translate the preferences of the citizenry, of the people, into public policy decisions. What is that, that uh, mechanism? Uh, all of these are representative democracies. They're complex democracies. And the, 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 the question of, of the effectiveness of the systems of representation leave a lot to be desired. And this is where much of the criticism of democracies uh, comes from in, in the polls. People just simply don't feel like their representatives are representing them. The former, uh, uh, an important leader knocked on my door. Uh, he later became president of a country, had a very successful presidency, and then he ran for re-election again. And he, didn't, he was one of the 15 that didn't finish his term in office. Uh, but before being elected president one day, he knocked on my door at Georgetown, and he came into my office. He says, Arturo, I want you to help me do some constitutional changes so that we can get one representative for every citizen in my country. <laughs> and I'll give away the country. He said to me, Arturo, quiero tener un representante para cada boliviano, is what he told me, Bolivians. Well, what he was thinking about was, of course, a system of representation uh, like the US system, where you have a congressman who represents a district, but it's first past the post. Uh, and it's a majoritarian uh, district system. And in Bolivia and in many countries in Latin America, you have proportional representation <laughs> systems of, of, of elections. And proportional representation systems often don't provide the citizens with a direct link to their representative. The trouble is if you, if you chuck proportional representation systems and you go with the first past the post system like the US has, you're likely to engender all kinds of independent political entrepreneurs who owe their, uh, their, uh, their position to, to, the, to their own funders uh, and not necessarily to coherent political parties. And consequently, you create then a political uh, 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 structure uh, of, uh, that lacks a certain cohesiveness or discipline. 
And so one of the real trade-offs that political scientists work on is the trade-off between how do you get effective representation on the one hand and how do you get disciplined, cohesive political parties in order to really be able to come up with uh, the kinds of, of compromises and decisions that are necessary in order to, to produce the public policies that people want in democratic societies. And there's a big debate about this, and countries are, are struggling. Uh, it means ki coming up with different kinds of electoral systems, seeking uh, certain compromises. The Germans, for example, have a, a system that's a a compromise kind of system where you have a combination of first-past-the-post representation, a combination of proportional representation, and so on. Uh, the other part of this equation is parties themselves. And in fact, your electoral system can also encourage stronger, more cohesive parties. But in some cases, your electoral systems can maybe also encourage too strong of parties. And parties that might you know, as in Venezuela, uh, produce pacts with, with other parties that are, exclusion, that are exclusionary of other sectors within the society. And, and, a, and a significant, significant challenge, which only now public policy officials are looking at seriously, uh, and here I'm referring, of course, to, to, to even U.S. government officials, is the, the deficits of political parties. I mean, we've, we've put a tremendous amount of effort in, in democracy promotion kinds of activities, uh, essentially trying to uh, beef up uh, bureaucracies and try to make administra administrative tasks more effective, but we failed in, in, uh, in helping to, to encourage and strengthen political parties. And this is a, a, a challenge into the future. Finally, let me just mention briefly the uh, the issue of governance or the crisis of governance. And this is something I've been working on myself for some time. <clears throat> John Kerry, who's on your faculty here, who has done some excellent work in, the, in these fields. Um, uh, and the, 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 ch the challenge of governance in Latin America really has to do in, in, in many ways with the effectiveness of the presidential system in Latin America. Latin America has a significant problem the problem is that there's a disjuncture between multi-party systems. Uh, and Latin America has become increasingly multi-party. It used to be that countries in Latin America had two-party systems, but they're increasingly multi-party systems. So you have representation from a host of different parties. And guess what? When you have representation from a host of different parties, it's much more difficult to have a president then that has a majority of his own party in the Congress. And if you look carefully, as I have, at the 15 presidents that, never f that weren't able to finish their term, the great majority of these presidents that weren't able to finish their terms were not able to finish their terms because they did not have strong majorities in the parliament. And you know, a perverse logic tends to set in, which is hap happens a lot in the United States and may be happening more in the United States than we think. It may have happened more in the United States in the recent past than we're willing to admit. But this perverse logic that sets in, when the president doesn't have a majority of his own party in Congress, his, uh, his opponents in the Congress in some ways would prefer to see the president fail on the assumption that if the president fails, they will then be able to get the prize of getting the presidency next time around. And there's a logic of confrontation that develops rather than a logic of cooperation. The reasons are complex and they go beyond institutional rules, so I don't want to exaggerate, but the institutional rules are important. Take Mexico, for example. Mexico really is, when I mention the success of, of, of democracy in this era, Mexico, of course, would have to be put right at the top of a list of success stories. In some ways, Mexico was as Vargas Llosa, the great Peruvian writer, referred to the perfect dictatorship. You know, it outlasted some of the Soviet uh, 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 countries, uh, uh, socialist countries. Seventy years, it was run by, it, the, you know why it was a perfect dictatorship? Because uh, uh, you had a one-party state, but they had, there, was, there, was, there was genius to this one-party state. And the genius was 
that the president could only serve for six years, but the president could, uh, could appoint his successor. Nobody could tell the president, but he, once he appointed his successor, he had to go. So the problem that Michels talks about in terms of circulation of elites, the development of new leadership and so on, which is something that, the, that, that the, the communist regimes in Eastern Europe were never able to resolve, uh, uh, the, the Mexicans resolved fairly well. But of course by the 1980s, this regime also became corrupt, authoritarian, uh, and was not able really to be responsive enough to the challenges of, of a complex society now with 104 million people. So Mexico does move towards democracy. Uh, for the first time in the year 2000, you get a president elected from, from the opposition, and the country has made enormous strides in that regard. But President Fox is now entering his last of his six years in office, and he's a failed president. And he's a failed president because his party, the PAN, only has a, a minority in the Congress, and the two other large parties, the PRI that he defeated, uh, and the PRD, uh, which is a party on the left, uh, are simply not willing to cooperate with the president. And there's nothing that he's been able to do. Now, some people criticize his leadership, and it does leave something to be desired. Uh, but there's a structural problem. The structural problem is that he cannot make a deal with the opposition parties without the opposition parties fearing that he's going to get all the credit for any success that comes out, and therefore able to then have a successor from his own party get the presidency next time around. So they would prefer to see him fail on the, in the hope that they'd be able to get there uh, on the, uh, w with a failed president next time around. It's a very perverse system. This is, and this is what we saw in, e in Ecuador this past week. President Lucio Gutierrez was facing the same problem. And in fact, in some countries, it's even more difficult than in, than, in, than in Mexico, because in Mexico, at least you have three large parties. In other countries, you have a fragmented party system, which makes it much more difficult for these kinds of governing coalitions to be developed. So one of the things that, you know, that I've for some time now been talking to Latin Americans about, and this is, a, this is an issue that's very much on the table in our discussions of, of the consolidation of democracy in Eastern Europe as well, is whether or not presidential systems where you have one leader for a fixed term with no guarantee that there's going to be a cooperative government because of the complexities of divided government is going to succeed. And the, the question that then one asks is, would Latin America be better off with a parliamentary form of government? Um, the logic is very different. In a parliamentary form of government, you don't have a president. Uh, if the president exists, he's a figurehead president. And it's up to the, to the forces in parliament to, to come up to cobble a majority in order to be able to have a successful governing authority. And if a majority is not developed, then you go to elections. And crises of government don't become crises of regime. Uh, and we see now in the experience of Eastern Europe that the countries that had the more clear parliamentary regimes have been more successful. The ones that bought semi-presidential systems have been much more, com much, much, more, much more difficult because when you have a president and a prime minister, you can reify the conflict between the president and the parliament. But this is a complex issue that has to do with institutional design. And institutional design is an issue that, that Latin Americans are now focusing much more on and this debate, which had sort of dissipated for a while, is now very much on the forefront uh, of the thinking of people in the region who are wondering uh, what it takes really to make uh, presidential systems work properly. Um, mind you that they do work well in some places. Chile is an example and perhaps the best example of all. Uh, and in Chile, presidential system has worked despite the fact the president has not had majority of his, of his own personal party uh, in Congress because you've had very strong coalitions. But these coalitions in some ways are a product of Chile's history. They're a product of the brutal period of authoritarian rule. They're a product of the unwillingness of these leaders in these successful coalitions to risk perhaps a return to the past. Uh, and even in Chile some people are thinking then about some of these institutional changes that might be important. 
for governance. Well, let me conclude uh, this discussion with the last section of my, my remarks. Where has the U.S. government been in this discussion? Where, where has the U.S. been? And I think it's quite clear that before the end of the Cold War, um, part of the problem with the, or a significant factor in the inability of Latin American countries to consolidate democratic reg regimes was due to the fact that there, there was such a, a concern locally, but also supported by the United States, um, by sectors of society that democracy could lead to left-wing socialist governments. And so you had to hold the line. Uh, and of course, this whole process begins in 1954 in Guatemala, where a democratically elected government is overthrown by the military with support from the United States, which is really the beginning of the Guatemalan civil wars. And after 1954, it becomes extremely difficult uh, in Latin America for any government to get to into office with sort of a leftist or populist uh, program without being pushed back by the military and local elites and ultimately with support from the United States. And I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the most emblematic years was when the new Kennedy administration came into office and wanted to redesign policy towards Latin America. And they, you know, they came up with an alliance for progress. Uh, the Kennedy administration argued very strongly that we need to meet the communist threat by addressing the fundamental social equity issues. And this is what was behind the Alliance for Progress. And we need to support democratic governments and work with democratic governments in doing that. But the first military coup that the Kennedy administration faced was when Frondizi was overthrown in Argentina in 1972. And there was a big split in the Kennedy administration at the time with Ted Sorensen and Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and some people really pushing to, to try to push back on the military coup, and others arguing, no, the realities of the Cold War are such that the United States really cannot get involved in that game. And, you know, unfortunately that set down a precedent for a similar welcoming on the part of the United States of a military coup in Brazil in 1964, and that military coup in Brazil in 1964 in some ways inaugurates the most hardline era of authoritarian regimes in Latin America. Of course, we, we are familiar with the, f the, the situation in Chile, uh, where the United States government worked very actively and very strongly to prevent the accession to power of an elected uh, president uh, who was elected by the people, but who represented a leftist posture. Um, so US government policy has not been very welcoming of democracy, it's sort of ironic that we should be talking about these sort of things today because similar sorts of phenomena happen in other places in the world. And a lot of people are arguing that we reaped what we sowed, uh, not only in places in Latin America, but you know, maybe in Iran you know, and in other places in the world because we, 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 we essentially opted for the authoritarian solution on the assumption that the authoritarian solution, Gene Kirkpatrick's famous article, you know, Authoritarianism may be grubby and bad, but authoritarianism is a better way to hold off on the possibility of falling into a communist or a, 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 a totalitarian solution. And uh, it would be excessive idealism to think that democracy itself, if it's consolidated, is not necessarily going to be prey of authoritarianism. Well, this changes dramatically, really, this whole pattern with the end of the Cold War. It actually starts in the second uh, Reagan administration and w under George Shultz in the State Department vis-a-vis -vis Latin America where the discourse begins to change. Uh, the Soviet Union is waning and the US government begins to come around to a view that's very s different from the one that was postulated by Gene Kirkpatrick who said an authoritarian regime is a necessary evil in a sense and we need to support it because we don't want to fall into something worse. That logic changed to another logic, which was, wait a minute, consolidating democratic institutions is fundamentally in the US interest. Because when you have democratic institutions and democratic governments, you have more legitimacy. And legitimate governments over the long haul 
are those that will best serve our interests. We'll be able to work with them better. And this, this is a, a, a policy that, as I say, begins uh, in an incipient way in the second Reagan administration and, of course, takes on a much more um, uh, 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 shape or, uh, and in, the, in the first Bush administration and in the Clinton administration. It was a cornerstone of our, our policy when I was in the Clinton administration. Fundamental argument was the United States stands with constitutional democracy in the region. We support constitutional democracy and we will make every effort to ensure that the constitutional process not be interrupted even if we don't like the people who are elected by their own people. Uh, Haiti was a very emblematic case of this because there weren't too many people in Washington who were enamored of Aristide, but Aristide was elected overwhelmingly in the only first election, the only real free election in Haitian history in December of 1990. Um, and it was hard. It was hard at various times uh, because of this tradition of, 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 uh, of authoritarian rule and the, and the weakness of, of democratic institutions. But the United States was helped in this effort by a focus on, on working with others to advance the interests of the region and consolidate democratic institutions as a hemispheric project and not just simply as a project of the U.S. government alone. It wouldn't have worked otherwise. What was required really was the development of a consensus that it's in the interest of all of the countries of the region to support democratic institutions, to, to make sure uh, that governments aren't overthrown by the military, to make it very clear to military leaders that a coup or a military government would just simply not uh, be viable uh, in terms of its ability to function in a highly globalized uh, environment. <coughs> I had some personal experience with this. Uh, after General Oviedo in Paraguay went to see his president, President Wasmosi, and, and essentially told him, listen, I want you to do the following policy things. General Oviedo was the head of the army. The president said, look, you know, I've, I've been conceding on all sorts of fronts. Uh, I can't do this anymore. And it's finally, there's a confrontation between the president and General Oviedo. And General Oviedo, and the president asked General Oviedo to step down. And the, and, the, and the general said, no, I'm not going to go. Uh, and he assumed that Wasmosi would do what generals in the past had done, I mean, what presidents in the past had done. is When the military essentially says, I'm sorry, we're not, I'm not going to obey your orders, that he would go. What Oviedo didn't count on, of course, was a significant pushback on the part, not only of the United States, but of the Brazilians. And Brazil has a tremendous amount of influence in Paraguay, or the Argentinians and others, and the work of the Organization of American States, which invoked for the, fir for, for the first time in Paraguay, uh, Resolution 1080, which says that if there's an interruption of the constitutional order in any country in the hemisphere, the foreign ministers will gather and appropriate measures will be taken to address this issue. Uh, in the case of Haiti, remember, the foreign ministers of the OAS decided to implement an embargo in order to try to push back on the military junta that replaced Aristide there. In the case of uh, uh, Paraguay, as I say, uh, General Oviedo had to step down. He later, I was later told myself, because I went down as a, the special emissary of, 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 of the U.S. government right after these incidents to assure President Wasmosi and, and, and people in the Congress and so on, the United States continued to support them. And the general in charge of the Air Force told me at that time, he said that Oviedo said, you know, I didn't think that they were gonna, they were gonna be, be, be uh, willing to really implement this measure, the Resolution 1080. And he said, with, the, with Resolution 1080 now, the era of military coups in Latin America has ended. Uh, let me, let, me, let me end by, by making a couple of comments about 
the, this administration, and here I'm gonna be somewhat critical of this administration, uh, I think they've, they've dropped the ball on this focus, not, not in terms of their policy statements, not in terms of their policy objectives, but in terms of their policy actions. Uh, it's one, th one thing you learn, uh, and as an academic, I, I had a hard time learning this, but is that policy doesn't necessarily respond to clear blueprints. Uh, on the other hand, if you, don't have a, if you don't have a series of guiding assumptions, then you're really in trouble. Uh, you have to have a series of guiding assumptions, but there is no clear blueprint. And one of the most important ways which policy does, uh, which, which policy is made, is through the management of crises. In a sense, governance and foreign policy is crisis management. And when you handle those crises, you're making policy for the future. And this administration, in terms of the issue that we're talking about today, made a very serious mistake in the case of Venezuela. In March of 2002, there was, a, an, in, there was an insurrection in Venezuela, a strong, strong uh, uh, support to opposition forces that were, were demanding the resignation of, of President Chavez. The military supports the opposition groups, sect important sectors in the military, and essentially they ask Chavez to resign. This, this scenario played itself out in some of the other cases of presidents that did not reach the end of their term in office. What was, was, was really an anomaly in this particular case was that the military, instead of simply saying, look, you can, can't govern anymore, Mr. President, and there's a limit to how much we can repress people in the streets. Uh, what are you gonna do? They're demanding your head which is what the Ecuadorian uh, military said to President Mawad or other places. Uh, this is a really difficult situation for us, which you can interpret as fairly not so subtle pressure perhaps on the military to ask the president to resign because he's become part of the problem and no longer the solution. In the case of Venezuela, the military went much further. They actually countenanced the installation of a provisional government that in turn issued a decree abolishing the Supreme Court and abolishing the Congress. And what did Washington do? Instead of immediately coming out, as had been done from, as I say, from the second Reagan administration on, come out in no uncertain terms, condemn what was be what it had become a classic military coup. It was a classic military coup because the military put in a provisional government that had no basis in the Constitution whatsoever, and that government by decree, which had no basis, of course, in constitutional law or democratic practice either, moved to try to shut down the Congress and the Supreme Court. And Ari Fleischer at the White House in his statement said, we regret the situation in Venezuela. Uh, a lot of what's happened in Venezuela is the, is the fault of President Chavez. He has now resigned. We support the provisional government or the interim government. It's that last sentence that becomes really a significant problem for the administration then and continues to be a problem today because they deviated in this crisis management from the clear sense that you, can, you should not tolerate that. Not only that, the United States did not call for invoking 1080, Resolution 1080. In other words, the entire mechanism that had been set up in the hemisphere that was used in many of these other cases, beginning with the uh, overthrow of Aristide, uh, that should have been done immediately. The talking point should have been another study. The talking point should have said, you know, we regret that President Hugo Chavez may have brought some of this on himself, but we, in no uncertain terms, uh, will not I I accept uh, 
an unconstitutional change of government in Venezuela, and we immediately call on the OAS, the Organization of American States, to convene in Washington, D.C., and to consider invoking Resolution 1080. Uh, and if the United States had done that at that time, we would be in a much better position in dealing with Venezuela today. Because the moment we did that, we lost some of the moral and political leadership that we had in the hemisphere. And it's caused problems for us in two ways. It's caused problems with us in dealing with Venezuela and dealing with Chavez himself. Because here we are calling on Chavez to be a Democrat, and yet we countenanced, we countenanced a military coup against him. And our credibility has also been damaged with the other countries. When we say, oh, we need to convene a meeting of the Organization of American States now uh, to deal with this situation in Ecuador, people say, well, you know, aren't you, why do you have a double discourse is basically what you're hearing. And I've been hearing a lot of this recently because this week uh, there was uh, a couple dozen, in the last two or three weeks there have been a couple dozen foreign ministers in Washington uh, discussing these issues from Latin America. Uh, and they, they say, why do you criticize only the Venezuelans and you didn't criticize the president of Ecuador when he shut down the Supreme Court twice? Let me just simply end by saying you have to have a clear policy. You can't have a double discourse. And you can't drop the ball because you don't like a certain president and then you wind up making a, an exception to your principles and your rules. When you do that, you undermine your own credibility. Uh, I'm hopeful that after Condi Rice's trip to Latin America this week, that she learned a lot of these things. She was told a lot of these things by her counterparts in the region, and that we may be facing a better era uh, regarding Latin America in the next two years of the Bush administration. Thank you very much. That's, a, that's a, a, a very good question. The United States did not, to my knowledge, did not actively discourage under other countries uh, from, from bringing it up. Uh, but um, I think that was more a product of the fact that events move very swiftly. And what happened was that after this provisional government was put into to, to place and they issued a decree to shut down the Congress and the Supreme Court, the military, another faction in the military, thought that their colleagues had gone too far, and they actually reinstated Chavez. And then the United States called for the invocation of Resolution 1080, but the horse was already out of the barn. Um, now, truth be, be told, some other countries in the region also hesitated, uh, and there was some debate within the region, because some countries felt that, 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 that they had they had dropped the ball on this, uh, and it wasn't just simply the United States' fault. You expressed some concern about the divisiveness of the multi party system. Uh, might you also be concerned in the example of uh, Argentina, where you had the failure of the radicalists, where there was somewhat of a balanced system with the terrorists, and now instead of getting that active policy that they Personality, uh, within the party, and the right. This is a great question, and in fact, one thing that I neglected to mention that I should have was that while the overall pattern in the region, as is as I described, of weak presidents, you know, having difficulty governing because they don't have proper majorities, uh, there are two or three cases of presidents that have very strong majorities and don't have much uh, opposition. And that's as damaging to democracy as well. It, it, it raises the issue of the fact that, uh, and, you know, you know what Chavez's main problem is? Chavez has no understanding 
that democracy really does involve constitutional democracy and not democracy defined as the rule of the majority. Democracy is not the rule of the majority. Democracy is not, uh, you know, of the majority, by the majority, and for the majority. It's of the people, for the people, by the people, which essentially means that you have guarantees for the minority and you have ma guarantees for future majorities. And there's a real, real danger for democracy of, of having strong majorities unless you have constitutional safeguards. Uh, and what I worry about is there are two countries that I worry about in this regard, Venezuela and Argentina. I think you're absolutely right. The, the radicals in Argentina polled only 6% of the vote last time, and, and Argentina is back to being a, essentially a, a very strong one-party system. Uh, both presidents in Argentina and in, and in Venezuela are very popular. Chavez is now at 70% approval ratings. Um, Kirchner is not too far behind. Um, and uh, it, it, there is a populist streak there, and it is, it is worrisome. Right. I think another really good question, uh, and in fact an issue that's being debated a lot in, in Latin America, and does it, to what degree is some of the, the crisis of democracy also the result of the imposition of uh, a, you know, an economic model uh, that, that has uh, contributed to uh, aggravating uh, perhaps the, 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 the social situation uh, in, in, the, in the region. I don't I don't happen to accept that premise myself. I think that the, the neoliberal reforms were important. Uh, and in fact, one of the really interesting things about Latin America is that even the most populous governments in Latin America have accepted uh, one of the cornerstones of uh, the neoliberal reforms, and that is that Latin America cannot return to the era of, of loose finances and loose budgets and deficit spending, which causes inflation because most people now understand that inflation was the cruelest tax of all. And that in fact, it hurted, hurt <coughs> the poor uh, more than any other sector of the society. Uh, so you find that most countries in the region are running budget surpluses. Uh, and there's f significant support for that uh, because, be be because of the unsustainability of running deficits. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that th the people who did the Washington Consensus were right in, in arguing that it's only trade and it's only opening up uh, uh, markets that's going to solve the problems of the region. And I think now that, now that people are focusing on the real challenges of the region, people are going back to, the, to, the, to, the, to some of the social questions. Unless you really address problems of poverty, they address the problems of inequality, unless you have effective programs to do that, you're not going to be able to increase the educational levels that you need, uh, the, the health levels that you need, the standards of living that you need, in order for the region to be competitive in the world economy. Uh, so it's not only a, an issue of justice, it's also an issue of, of, of competitiveness, of being smart in how you deal with, with the challenges of, of, of uh, the, um, the global economy. Uh, and finally, I think that, that, that implicit in your question is also the notion that democracy is not just the institutions of governance that I've been talking about, but it's also an attempt to make government more meaningful. Uh, and, and so uh, engaging people, uh, you know, encouraging greater participation and greater access uh, and not continuing with patterns of exclusion so that people really do find more of a say in the democratic process is, is right on the mark. I happen to disagree very ch strongly with Chavez because Chavez's conception of, of participatory democracy is in my book a little bit too close to the fascist models of, of the early 20th century, which participatory democracy is the direct relationship between the leader and the people. 
you know, uh, skeptical of some of the intermediary associations and skeptical of the institutions of representatives of government. I think participation needs to be channeled through, more effectively, through the institutions of representative government and not fall into the trap of these sort of plebiscitarian sorts of uh, definitions of democracy, you know, referenda and things like that that can be manipulated and were manipulated uh, in historical experiences by, by leaders in the past. Yeah, I think it's a perfectly logical question, too, because if there's one country that doesn't fit in the pattern of anything that we've talked about today uh, is Cuba. I mean, Cuba is clearly the outlier. It's the one country in the region that uh, hasn't had a, a democratic election in a, a very long time. Uh, it, uh, it's, 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 it's coming at some point. The problem is that all the pundits and all the commentators and all the scholars have always been mistaken because they've always assumed it was around the corner. Uh, and rumor is that there's still people in Miami that have suitcases packed in case Castro falls and they can go home. And, and it's, it's obviously a very vexing uh, problem. Uh, in some ways, it's, it's, related, it's related to the fact that the, you have to understand the Cuban Revolution is is also still run by the people who are the original founders of the revolution. And I think that's somewhat different from the situation, for example, in Eastern Europe, where you, you move beyond the, the first generation. Uh, this is a generation that, that, that did the revolution. Uh, the other thing that Castro did extraordinarily effectively, <coughs> nobody else has really succeeded in doing it. Um, it's probably the key to his success. And that is, he exported the counter-revolution. The entire counter-revolution left. Uh, and that was a socioeconomic strata. It was a, it was a class strata. It was an ethnic strata. It was a racial strata. And the country changed fundamentally. And a lot of the people who live in Cuba today are not particularly happy about the potential prospect of the people who left and all their progeny coming back, particularly if, if things have changed significantly for them. So that's one of the issues that, that contributes to a certain degree of, of stasis uh, on the island itself. Uh, and the most effective dissidents now in Cuba, like Osvaldo Bayá, who's an extraordinary uh, man, and I had the privilege of introducing him at Georgetown after he'd come back from uh, he just come back from, and he went back to Cuba, but he'd been allowed to leave to, 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 to receive the Sakharov Prize of the European uh, Union and uh, came through Washington and I introduced him at Georgetown and um, his only public speech, uh, his, his effectiveness is that he, he, he represents clearly the dissident movement in Cuba and while he has nothing but respect for the people outside, he makes it also very, very clear that whatever change takes place in Cuba has to take place with the people in Cuba working that, you know. And in fact, there's been, there are, it's, it's pretty obvious that if there's another problem that, that has kept Castro in, 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 in power is not only they, they export the counter-revolution, the counter-revolution has also been running Cuba policy for the United States, which has probably contributed to rigidifying uh, uh, the the uh, the posture, uh, and many people would argue, and I would argue this as well, is that in some ways the embargo, instead of playing uh, into the hands of the, liber the the those that need to be liberated, played clearly in the hands of of Fidel Castro himself, and is one of the reasons why we haven't gotten any change. I think you're going to see a movement like you saw in Eastern Europe, and it's probably going to be more from within, and it probably is going to be more gradual. And one of the interesting, really interesting thing that's happening now is that there are more and more people in the Cuban-American community who are saying, we don't want the Romania outcome for the transition in, in Cuba. We don't want some kind of a bloody uh, breakdown. The, you know, the, the paradigm always was in the past. You know, let's kill him, let's get rid of him. Uh, now people are talking much more, how do we have a staged transition to democracy in Cuba that allows for something of a soft landing of a society that, that is, you know, that, 
that is going to open up at some point, uh, but where the opening process may be very determinative in terms of the outcome that you get. about the, the impact of the neoliberal reforms in the sense that you know the 1980s identified the beginning of this new era of democratizationism precisely as the debt crisis and the, the neoliberal reforms opening the markets, dismantling strong states, and, and in fact in many ways opening what you know the, the opening for democracy, which in, in many ways was a kind of economic decentralization as well. The states did not have kind of economic power over economies as they did before and therefore establishes the conditions for a democratic openings in Latin America. You also talk about though, the, the, uh, the great inequalities that persist, the economic inequalities that persist in Latin American societies that many people argue are being perpetuated by the neoliberal reforms and the globalization of economies and so on and so forth. So to what degree do you, would you see at all the, the neoliberal reforms all being on one hand a source of Democratic opening, but also a continuing problem for the consolidation of democracy uh, that we have in Latin America today. And I ask this question because the, the difficulties that you cited as the four crises of, of capacity, of, of accountability, of representation, and, um, and governability are all internal to the political process itself, the institutions. Uh, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about sort of the, that, that wider sense of, in a sense, the, the social and economic impacts of the neoliberal reforms, and could that possibly be one of the problems now as well of uh, preventing or, or slowing down the process of democratic consolidation and leading to populist leaders like Chavez and others who can then appeal to the masses because they're so discontented and disillusioned uh, that, that then reinstitute that, that kind of Calvillo like style of rule that has like, been so notorious in Latin America? Uh, okay. Uh, no. <laughs> The, the, listen, um, um, I, I guess w w one of the premises of your, of, of, of your question was that, that somehow the states were stronger before. I'm not sure the states were stronger. For, the states may have been bigger before. They were more bloated. You know, they, you, you had all kinds of state companies. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of corruption in these state companies. The militaries in a place like Ecuador still run a lot of the state companies. Uh, uh, it, in some ways, it was a parceling out of, of the state to economic interests, um, a very private regarded uh, approach to, to this sort of thing. It, it varies from country to country. In Ecuador, may, maybe more on the sort of private regarded uh, side, uh, you know, where everything was sort of, uh, everything public was done to, to benefit specific private interests, and you didn't have a broader, and that would be different from the Mexican industrialization policy, for example, which from the year 1940 to 1970 produced 6% growth rates per year under an import substitution industrialization model. The trouble is that that model does become exhausted, you know, and, and uh, people who argue uh, against the, 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 the negative aspects of neoliberalism um, I, I assume are not arguing that you go back to the sort of import substitution m model that you had before because, of course, it, it, it really was in, in many ways a, a model that, that may have been successful, but became exhausted, to use the term that I think is the most, most valuable term. It just simply was not able to re retain the kind of competitiveness that you need uh, uh, in these societies. Now, the the, the, the liberal uh, uh, reforms, uh, I think, my, my, I would argue, they are very important, necessary conditions. The mistake is to think that they are sufficient conditions. And, and, and when you talk about sufficient conditions, you're talking not only about other public policy strategies, but also about effective public, strate public policy strategies to deal with some of the negative aspects of those sorts of economic reforms. Trade liberalization is an example of that. You know, you're, you, it's not very helpful to the Guatemalans to have trade liberalization if that's going to put a lot of people in the countryside out of work, and if there's no response to that. Uh, but I would submit to you that, that there are countries that have been successful. And, and I, guess, I guess one of the reasons why I take this position um, is because I've, I've gone down the, the, the complex, difficult route that many of my Chilean colleagues went down. So I'm Chilean myself, and you know, 
most of my friends, uh, in, and I was a strong opponent of the Pinochet government, and uh, very close to people in the Socialist Party, and, and more in the left of the Christian Democratic Party. We were all very critical of some of the early reforms that were made. I today would argue very vehemently that the success of the Chilean model today is not because the, the military government bought a different economic model and that made the country go places. I think the military bought an economic model that was important for the Chileans to implement, but that implementation of that model would not have succeeded if it had not been for the fact that Chile also had strong democratic institutions, it had rule of law, it had various other things that preceded the military government and they were part in the sense of, a, of a, you know, in a path dependent sort of way of a series of structures that, that, that essentially uh, were also more democratic and more open. Uh, and Chile has been successful. It's the one country in the region that has per capita income uh, uh, levels at the end of the 90s that exceed the early 1980s. Now a lot of other countries are recovering again. It's the one country in the region where there's been a significant decline in absolute poverty levels uh, and, and overall poverty levels. And it's a country that's been growing significantly. Uh, it's a country that, that has bought the neoliberal models. It's a country that's integrated into the world economy. But the Chileans also paid attention to some of these social issues, safety net issues, and they were much more gradualist on, the, on, on some of their openings. For example, they did not uh, allow massive uh, portfolio capital to come coming into the country without controls. The, the key is strong state control, not necessarily you know, policies that are not neoliberal policies. Neoliberal policies with strong regulatory capacity is the way I would argue this, but also with a forward-looking leadership that is looking to try to address some of these social problems. Guatemalan specialist, so I see Latin America for Guatemalan condition. Well, you know, I have a theory as a Latin Americanist that that they were our, our view of Latin America is always informed by the country we know best. So Howard, we are the you know it's the Dominican Republic. Uh, I am of course caught by my Chilean uh, background. You're uh, in Guatemala, and and that of course does suggest uh, the a uh, very interesting point of how diverse the, the 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 region is, and how some of the generalizations that you make for some countries don't apply quite as much to others. Uh, one more question is about the economics. Uh, it seems that recently the Chinese leaders have been in, in Latin America working new economic deals. Does this uh, entry of China as an economic power into the region <coughs> create a new situation for the United States in that countries in the region no longer have to look northward for the kind of uh, economic assistance that they once did? Uh, yeah, the, the Chinese are not, are not uh, in the business of uh, doing economic assistance, although they might be willing to invest in certain areas where they where they need to where they need to get raw materials, and and something very curious has been happening in Latin America regarding China and the growth of China and India, uh, and that is that on the one hand you have a tremendous amount of fear that Latin America will once again be left behind, you know, that it was on the cusp, that it, you know, it was making the reforms and that somehow it didn't quite quite get there as the you know massive investments begin to shift towards these giants that the, the last study of the National Intelligence Council and the 2020 project, I was involved in the Latin America part of the 2020 project, uh, suggests uh, that by you know 2020 it's really going to be a, a multipolar world uh, and it's no longer going to be a, a one um, a unipolar world anymore so Chavez can relax a little bit uh, and the Chinese can relax a little bit. Uh, but. I'll tell you, the Latin Americans are worried about it uh, because they see a lot of their industries. The Mexicans, for example, see some of their maquila going to, to China and some of the, these manufacturing platforms, um, assembly plants and things like that are, are, are moving elsewhere. On the other hand, Argentina is doing well right now because it's selling soybeans to, to, the, to the Chinese. And this voracious you know, demand that the Chinese are going to have for raw materials is going to put uh, Latin America in a fairly good place. Uh, the, if it, for those countries that are, that are, that are able to sell the, 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 the raw materials, you know, the Bolivians are stuck with the fact that they have a lot of gas, one of the best deposits in the world, but they cannot get it out of the ground. But the, but the countries that are able to make these deals are going are to, I think, benefit uh, from this. Uh, 
Look, the United States is still 76% of the output of the Western Hemisphere. If you add Mexico and Canada, you get to 85% of the output of the Western Hemisphere. You add Brazil, you get to 92% of the output of the Western Hemisphere. And all the rest of the countries are in the last 5 or 6%. So the United States is not going to go away as a significant economic force uh, you know, in, 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 a, in, in an area that Latin America needs to worry about. But sure, these other areas will provide possibilities for Latin America if, they, if they're able to, to do the kind of reforms, though, that they need in order to be competitive internationally. A, they have to sell their gas. Two, they really need to invest in education and other things like that so that the, the kind of products that they produce are going are to be more valuable in a globalized economy. Well, you know, one of the one of the real uh, unfortunate fallouts of the of the Argentine uh, collapse was that um, it really and it you know with the with the Mexico peso crisis of 1994, December 1994, there was a lot of uh, concern about where Latin America was going, uh, and then you had the Asian financial crisis and the Brazilian crisis, uh, uh, but it was really only after the Argentine. Uh, collapse, which is the largest default, remember, in history uh, at this point. I mean, the Argentines owed $140 billion, and uh, um, it, a lot of companies really were very uh, uh, concerned about whether or not they could go back in to, to, to Latin America. I think you're beginning to see a, a change now. I think that there is, there is more of a willingness uh, for investors to look at the region. Uh, but I'll tell you, I, I hear more and more uh, from investors who are concerned about uh, rule of law kinds of questions. Questions of, of am I going to be treated fairly in terms of the judicial rules? Will, 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 will um, uh, judicial insecurity be a problem for me? Uh, and so, so while you while you see opportunities, I think, for investment, people are still wanting to, to make sure that, that the game, the rules of the game are properly set out before you see a, a significant return to the region. The, the halcyon days of privatization when everybody rushed down and bought up all these uh, previously state-owned companies, um, I think are, are, gonna, are not going to return soon. 